John Asperian, welcome back to the Marketing Study Lab podcast. Thank you for having me again, Peter. Fantastic. I can now say that I'm a Marketing Study Lab two-timer. Two-timer. <laughs> and, and it is actually a club of two people at the moment. Ooh. So if I get my hat trick, I'll be, I'll be the one and only. Yeah, absolutely. You have to write another book or, or do something. You have to write another book. Oh, God. That's I know, yeah. Two years of my life. That's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just do the audio, an audio version of a book next time, and then we can come on and talk about that. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Right. Okay. Okay. Welcome. But even though you are a two-timer, it doesn't mean you get away from having a random opener thrown at you. And I've been practicing saying this, so let's hope that now we're recording, I don't get it wrong. But can you explain what a receptive bilingualism is? Yes, it is when you can understand a language, but you can't speak it. Okay. Seems very weird, but it does affect me and I know other people it affects too. So um, I grew up in a household that where Armenian was spoken, Mm -hmm. but I never got to learn it systematically. And then as I grew up in the UK, it kind of faded away, but I can still understand it if it's spoken to me. I just can't speak it back so receptive bilingualism is the ability to understand the language but not speak it wow learn something new every <laughs> single day and that that is a a, a truism of john asperian and it isn't something that's false and if you want to know something that's false check out his website <laughs> <laughs> nice one anyway moving on um to because you, you're a, a two-timer on the podcast, I don't really want to go back over what's brought you to this stage in your career. I, I, I sure. want to have a focus on the, the, the present and the future. Mm-hmm. So what's 2020 looked like for you so far and what's on the cards for the rest of the year? Um, well, it's mostly been focused on getting my book finished and out into the world. I finished writing Content DNA at the end of 2019 and every. Ever since then, I've just been managing the publication process of it. So doing, getting the editing done, getting the typesetting done, proofreading, printing, and all sorts of stuff to get to where we are now, towards the middle of the year where the book is actually a physical thing in people's hands. Uh, And also I've been managing the release of uh, my first ever professionally designed website. So that's been a long time in the coming as well. So two really big projects that I finally got off my desk. And um, assuming that the coronavirus goes away sometime soon, then later in the year, I hope that I'll be able to do more in the way of in-person events, in-person training and speaking. Um, I really want to get into that more because I think I know my subject matter quite well and I'm kind of used to speaking now in mm. public and I, I just want to do more of that kind of stuff. It's more fun for me. That's that's cool. Maybe, maybe get to a football game at, at some point, like maybe 2021, you know. Yeah, I can barely remember the rules of the game right now, to be honest. It just feels like it's just a lifetime ago that I last watched a live match. So, yes, very much hoping that we can we can do that sometime soon. If, if anyone from the FA is listening, uh, John's just said that he can't remember many of the rules. So maybe you want to tap him up for being a referee. I, I don't know. You know, it could be it could be something on the cards. I could be senior management, couldn't I? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> OK, that's enough of FA bashing. Um what what I want to chat to you today about, John, is is a few chapters from your book, and and let's look at them specifically because I think if we cover the whole book and what it entails, we'll be here all day, if not for three or four days, which I'd love to do. But you know, we've both got families and other things that you know draw us away from from our our day jobs. God damn it! But that aside, um, why did you write the book first and foremost? Okay, well, I wanted to help business owners to take better control over their their personal branding and their content and their marketing, because a lot of people come to me as a copywriter and they ask for words that go on their website. And then I kind of stop them in their tracks and say, right, what is the DNA of your business? What are we, what are you all about? What is your shape and what are we trying to achieve and who are we trying to say it to? And and often they just don't have a really clear idea of those things or they've just wasted a load of money doing some branding exercise. And then they end up with a, you know, with a PDF lost on a SharePoint drive somewhere because they they never pay attention to it. So 
not all people are going to have a chance to work with me to do their copywriting. So I thought I'd just take the lessons that I've learned over the last 10 years of doing these consultations with business to business customers and just put them in, in one place. And, um, and yeah, so that, that's, that's where the book came from. And also I, I stumbled upon my own brand identity kind of by accident. You know, there's a, there's a story about this in the book about how I had this moment where I discovered the idea of being relentlessly helpful. And I just, I just focused my whole personal brand around that idea and it's had spectacular results for me. It's often echoed back to me, almost like the, you know, the chorus of a song. Um, and so I, I, I didn't want others to have to rely on that kind of luck to develop their own personal brand identity. So I kind of put in um, a framework for trying to do it yourself. And uh, that's how the book has been birthed. I think content DNA is, is bang on, particularly from, from your point of view with how you've grown and developed a, a a business, I suppose, even though you're a one man band, uh, simply because you are what you say you are and you don't divert from that. Everything you do has those connotations in it. Yeah, well, and I think that's a really, really important point. You know, when, when people talk about what, what should my brand values be and what, what should I even be doing with my business, you know, uh, it just come, it's got to come back to you've got to do something that is true to you so that you can always do that thing, always be known for that one thing. And regardless of what situation you're in, you know, coronavirus comes along and knocks everyone sideways. If you've got those foundational blocks of your brand in place, the things that will never change, always true, then you can just express that every time you show up in content and in the way you deal with your customers and in the way you run your business and in what the you know the way the business is set up so it's a really important thing to get right and I, I often say to people I claim to be relentlessly helpful it's that's a massive claim if you think about it it's a massive yeah, claim yeah. and if I and if I'm not then you should call me out for it because I'm a fraud essentially I'm just I've just put some pretty words together and it doesn't mean anything and I think you, you should be in a position where no one can ever call you out because you are being faithful to whatever you've promised the world that you're going to be. Mm -hmm. so it's a really, really important thing to get right. Speaking of which, that, that brings us nicely into the first chapter that I want to discuss, and that's chapter five. Mm -hmm. uh, be known for one thing, which we kind of alluded to right there. But going back a few steps, how, how do you actually do this? I know it might be difficult to answer that on an individual basis for anyone listening, but how do people do this? Where should they start with trying to understand what they need to be known for? I, th I think it starts really by actually understanding what your place of power is and what you enjoy doing most and what, what is the maximum value you can bring to the world. So you might be able to bring a lot of value, but it might be something that just makes you miserable, you know, or, or something that's actually not very valuable, but you absolutely love doing it. Well, that, that's not brilliant either, because you, you're probably not going to have a roof over your head. So there needs to be a balance struck between what is the maximum value you can provide while doing something that you enjoy. So that the confluence, you know, the, the joining point of those two things is really what you want to aim for. But the important thing about being known for one thing is just it's far, far easier to remember a small bit of information. You know, if you if you try and occupy a small memory slot in someone else's brain, that's much easier than getting them to remember that, oh, he does logo design and he, he does mm -hmm. websites and he writes stuff and oh, he does podcasts as well. And um, uh, I can't remember. I'm not sure what he's really good at. I don't know. Much easier to say, he's that marketer that plays with Lego all the time, in your case. <laughs> or, or in my case, it might be, he's that bloke that's on LinkedIn with his tips and his cartoons all the time. It's just, just being known for just a very small set of things. Uh, and so that comes from, you know, that comes from a bit of introspection. That's the thing. That's why I say it's very hard for me to be prescriptive to anyone I don't mm. know tall um but uh to, to to understand what it is that you really like doing that provides value and then boil it down into if you could do only one thing be known for only one thing do that and be known in only one place as well mm -hmm. it's a really important thing because one of the big mistakes i've made in the past is trying to 
just have that kind of buffet approach to social media, you know, a little bit of Twitter, a little bit of Facebook, you know, a little sprinkle of Instagram. And it just, it doesn't work because we're busy people, mm. right? Unless we're going to spend our whole lives doing that, it's not going to work. So be known for one thing in one place. It's a much easier way to, to build credibility, build a, a, an addressable, meaningful audience um, that's the way to go. So often I do consultations with people and they say, I've got three businesses and I want to pr promote them all equally on LinkedIn. And I'm saying to them, probably that's not going to work because no one's going to have enough t attention to, to, to differentiate them, those things in their mind. So it's much easier to just focus on the thing that will give you the maximum income, the maximum joy at the same time uh, and do that rather than trying to spread yourself too thinly. Yeah, I, I com completely and utterly agree. And I think at the start, it, it, it's fine to have that kind of approach and test these things. And I think you'll find what, what you, 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 you love and what you don't like. And um, I, think, I think at some point you mentioned, is it a 30-month yeah. focus, is it? Yeah, it's a 30-month mindset. So the, my marketing mentor is Mark Schaefer. He interviewed me for his book, Known, in 2017. And he interviewed actually almost 100 other people, about 70 people's testimonies got into that book in the yeah. end. And he found on average, it takes two and a half years, which is 30 months, to become known for one thing in the industry of your choosing, whatever it is. If you're an artist, if you're a, you know, you might be some kind of plumber, you might be a copywriter like me, you might make tailor-made men's suits you know um and so that what that means is that there's no real overnight successes you know you've got to you've got to keep going to the gym basically if you want to build the muscle right, right? so if you're going to do something for that long it's really got to be something that you believe in it shouldn't be a chore um but you shouldn't do what a lot of people do they'll say oh okay i'm going to go and write some blog posts and then after a couple of months nothing very much happens and you go, well, that didn't work. Marketing doesn't work. <laughs> I've proved it. I'm going to quit now <laughs> and, and be poor for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, so, and it's the same with podcasting. You know, oh, I'm going to start a podcast and I've done 10 episodes and, and not many people are listening. Podcasting doesn't work. Yeah, but if you think about it, the ones who are getting all the success, they've done 200 episodes. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've, they've done the hard yards. And all you're seeing, maybe, if you look at them, is, oh, look how successful they are, and oh, everyone shares their stuff, and they've got loads of followers. And yeah, but look at all that stuff they had to do to get to that point. Um, and it's just the same all the way over. Whether you've got a YouTube channel, whether you're writing a blog, doing a podcast, anything, you just got to do it for long enough for people to start noticing. And this is exactly what I had on LinkedIn, you know. I, 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 I went deep on LinkedIn in 2017 and nothing happened for months. Nothing. I mean, literally, I didn't get a single client from it for like nine months. But I knew that it would work because I'd studied content marketing and because I'd seen all of these case studies of people who'd just been committed to one platform that they knew would work for them eventually. And lo and behold, now people do know me on LinkedIn. I do get business. So that's, that's one of my two main things in the book is is just to have that consistency once you've made a decision and picked your spot you've got to keep turning up and just have faith that it will work for you and, and don't quit too early because you never know when you're about to strike gold mm. I, it, it's really interesting that you mentioned uh, mark schaefer because i think um in in his latest book i think it's his latest book he, he mentions um joe wicks mm -hmm. Uh, and I think Joe, Joe, Joe Wicks has, has made um, a big impression on the UK, if not the world, over the past mm -hmm. three or four months mm -hmm. with his, his PE sessions in the morning and, and, you know, hats off to him. He gives all the money to charity and all, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and people, I hear people um, dismissing him or, or whatever it might be, but like, like the way he grew up, uh, the way he built his business, he used to stand outside a, a, a tube station in the morning handing out leaflets to say come and join me in a park and do some exercise uh, and and sometimes he had zero people turning up yeah. and like you know people look at him now it's, like, oh, it's all right for you you've got a book deal you've got this you've got yeah. that and it's like you don't see the bit the build up to that there's always a build up there's not an overnight success like you say 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Justin Bieber started by playing guitar on YouTube and hoped that he'd get a few followers. And whatever you think of him, he did the hard yards, didn't he? And now yeah. he's got a massive following. And it's just the same for every single person. There are very, very few true overnight successes. And if, if you're looking at social media and thinking that everyone is like that, everyone is massively <laughs> successful, and it just happened in a, in a flash for them, you, you, you're fooling yourself. You've got to do a lot of hard work for this stuff to work. Absolutely. And I think that brings us nicely on to a, another chapter jumping forward. That's chapter 12. So this is social media bad practices. So we're saying we need to be known for one thing and, and really focus and, and, and get deep and, and, and enjoy it and embrace it. It's got to be part of you, really. Yeah. But what should we avoid when it comes to social media and what are we seeing that is just terrible? Well, I'm, I'm going to try and focus this one on LinkedIn because that's my definitely sure. my place of power. Um, and, you know, there are just so many bad things on LinkedIn. So I, I think one of the worst things is sending generic invitations. You know, if you, if you want to try and network with people, then you should try and make an effort to get to know them and just mm. dropping, essentially dropping a business card in their hand and wandering off and then waiting for them to go and look you up and decide whether they ought to do business with you or add you to their network. I think that's that's the starting point of, of bad practice. I think any marketing practice that you wouldn't do in person is bad practice, pretty mm. much. You know, so if you don't talk to people, that's bad practice. You know, so if you, if you try to do the same thing on online, I think it's terrible. Um, and God, where can we go with LinkedIn? I mean, engagement pods, for example, terrible practice. So in other words, you get together in what I call an unholy alliance of a chat group where you say, you post something terrible and I'll go and like and comment and share on it. And then I post something terrible and you go and do the same to me. And we just fool the algorithms into thinking that people like this stuff. Well, that's just low value content, isn't it? It's it, That's not the way to be seen. It's not a good idea. So uh, that's another bad practice. Uh, another one is is just trying to build a network way too quickly. So Because what that means is that you go and try and connect with 100 people a day, 200 people a day. You don't have a chance to speak with them. And everyone becomes a number to you. That's not, that's not the way to build an engaged network. Mm. A lot of people ask me, like God, you 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 get a lot of likes and comments on your on your content. How can I do that? Well, one of the things is obviously to create something interesting in the first place, and I you know I can't just wave a magic wand and make your content great. But just engage with people properly is is the right thing. So it's don't ignore comments, don't ignore direct messages. You know, foster some kind of discussion. You're building a campfire, aren't you? You want people to come and be comfortable and warm there. And so if they leave you a comment, you should reply um, and you should try and get into conversations with those people. So it means building your network slowly. I'd rather make two or three good connections in a day than go and connect with 200 people because those 200 people won't give a damn about me if something goes wrong in my business or if I've got a challenge that I want to share, you know, because they don't know me. I'm just a number to them. But if I actually start to chat with people, read their profile, understand what they like, you know, maybe they like football and we bond over football and we have a chat about that. It's just that whole idea of just talking to people before leaping into business. And that's another one of the bad practices is you connect with someone and then bang, you're on their mailing list. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> or they're selling something to you. They're telling you that they've got a fix to your problem and they don't know you from Adam. You know, people talk to me about, oh, you know, we've got something that will help your organization. And I'm thinking, well, you couldn't have read my profile because you'd know that I was a one person business. Mm. So what the, what the hell? Um, so there's just, just way too much of that, I think, you know. Um, and, uh, well, another uh, practice that used to be common, I don't think it's as common these days, and especially not on LinkedIn, is that that old way of building the network by following people so that they would follow you back. And then you kind of secretly unfollow them so that it shows as though you're not following many people, therefore you're important, and yet you're building more followers. And there was automated software that would let you actually build your network this, day, this way, which I think is absolutely horrendous. So just all sorts of crappy practice that you would just never do if you were face-to-face -face with, with a person. Just always think of that first. If I were face-to-face -face with them, would I do this thing in the real world um, and you know, you, you probably wouldn't, would you? So, so try yeah. not to do it online either. 
Uh, absolutely. It, while you've been talking there, it's just a few things, how my mind works a bit crazy, but a few things kind of popped into it. And, and the first one was, I always say to people, um, when you are connecting with people, let, let's stick with LinkedIn. With LinkedIn, if you go to an event, you don't go up to people and say, hi, my name's John, please buy my stuff. It's like, so why are you doing this? Why are you doing it digitally? The, yeah. the, the second thing is that I'm, I'm currently getting a lot of emails that say, listen to your podcast and it's amazing. Do you want to try this free software that will get you such and such? And I'm like, y you haven't listened to it, have you? Come on, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. It's not amazing. No. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> um, and then the other two things with, with pods, the first thing that sprung to my mind was um, Star Wars and the dark side of the force. Okay. And we all know how that ended up, you know, so. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, yeah. Just, I mean, you just mentioned podcast there and I, you know, I've written an article about this because, you know, some people say, Oh, how do you get on podcasts? And it's, the answer is always just, just kind of be human in your approach to the host. Like a podcast host doesn't always get feedback about how well their, 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 their show is doing. Mm. It's, podcasts aren't really set up like that. So maybe you go and rate and review their stuff. Maybe you contact the host and say, I listened to episode three and I really loved it. And, you know, you covered blah, blah, blah. And I thought that was fantastic. Or I know that guest that you, you've spoken to, you know, just, just doing just human things like that. Just help the other person show that you've got some interest, real interest rather than sending them some cut and paste thing that you've also sent to 50 other podcast hosts saying, I would very much like to be a guest on your show. Uh, here is the value that I can provide. Oh, I a massive wall of text. You know, these are just not human ways of doing business. And I, and I just can't stand them. And I've, I've got one other really, really bad social media practice, yeah. which is really prevalent on LinkedIn, is the, the, the good old tag wall. So you get a notification, you know, Barry's tagged you in this post. All oh, right, okay, let's see what Barry's up to. And then you see this wall of blue in front of you, and you've got to you've got to play guess, you know, spot the tag. Mm. Like I know I'm in here somewhere. There's a hundred other names in here. What the hell's going on? And what's happening, of course, is they're just using you for engagement. They they they're using you as a signal. You know, you're being pointed to the post, and they want you to engage somehow. And they don't care about you because they wouldn't have tagged all of those people otherwise. So I don't want to be a brick in someone else's tag wall. And I get this happening about five or six times a day now. It's wow. really, really annoying. Um, and so I'm just starting to ignore it. And um, there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that if people start ignoring your tags, so if you do go off and run off and tag people all over the place and they go, what? What the hell's he doing? I, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna respond to this. But that could damage you as the person doing all of the tagging, because LinkedIn will say he's not getting much response to this. Mm. Not maybe not a good idea to promote his stuff through the network. So just be aware, because I think the social media algorithms. This is true on other platforms as well as on LinkedIn. They're being. They're becoming more aware of what bad practice is, and if they tweak their algorithm you know in such a way to, to to counter that then then doing bad things isn't going to work so just just try and do things the ethical way i think and you just it's just douche canoe practice isn't it Don't <laughs> hey there we go <laughs> <laughs> um I, I was listening to somebody and and they said i just thought it was brilliant just how they flippantly said it and they were talking about uh, seo and and previous practices that used to work mm -hmm. in like google rankings and, and and they said something along the lines of when google used to be stupid you could do this this and this <laughs> and it, it was just the fact that yeah that they're not stupid and 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 the other platforms aren't stupid either no that's right yeah you could do things like keyword stuffing mm -hmm. you know so you just put all your keywords in the in the metadata at the top of a post and it would it would rank well because it, it, you know, but yeah, Google and other platforms are just far too clever for that now. Mm -hmm. So, um, but if you do things the right way, if you provide something that is of value, then your content, I mean, I'm talking more generally about blogging here. If it's of value, then people stick around and read it for ages and you have this long dwell time, you know, people click into a post and they might sit there for five minutes consuming it all because it's so good. Mm. It's not spammy and salesy and full of ads and all that. Um, and that's a really strong signal to, uh, to the search engine. So just focus on 
providing as much value as I, as you can. That's, that's the core of the kind of business that I run anyway. Uh, again it's going back to the same things isn't it being relevant sticking to what you know writing good content helping people out etc etc yeah. yeah. uh, and, and this leads me nicely on to, to the final chapter that I, I want to talk about today uh, which is chapter 23 uh, what mm-hmm. to write about and how to find content ideas and I, I, I must admit that I'd say very recently I've, I've taken a, a, a back seat in LinkedIn simply because like I haven't felt I've got anything good to write about and, and finding content ideas. Sometimes you can hit a block. So what should we be writing about in our own fields from that one thing we want to be known about and how do we find ideas? Well, if you've got no ideas whatsoever, the first thing I would recommend is that you inspect your email inbox because if you've got any kind of business that's been running for a while, chances are you will have received questions. And you will have answered them one to one and it will have taken you a while to do so because it's quite, quite draining to sit there and answer question after question. But all business owners do it. Um, and so actually what you ought to do is look at all of the questions you've received and prepare really, really good answers that, that will, can be shown to people at scale. Hmm. So obviously you wouldn't have anything, anything sensitive in there. But uh, if you can answer a question at scale, that means that the next person who comes along, you can go, oh yeah, I've written about that. Or they've Googled the question and they've found your answer. And that sends a really strong signal to that person. It says, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's already answered this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of a trust factor, isn't it? Because if he's already answered this and he's already answered that and he's, he's answering all of my questions, Maybe I should just hire him now or buy his product or whatever it is. It's a really powerful thing to do rather than having a load of one-to-one conversations that never get aired. Uh, and therefore people don't understand what your expertise is. So inspect your email inbox. Um, think about all of the possible customer rejections, objections you might have. So what are the things that would stop people hiring you or buying your product? Think carefully about them. Just um, You might need to ask, friend or family member about that whatever business is it is you're in why wouldn't someone buy this mm. so if you can create content that that truthfully answers those objections that will again also build a lot of trust with your audience and this doesn't mean that you should try and make things shiny and wonderful and rainbows and unicorns because people don't really buy that and there's a, there is a bit in the book where, where I quote some research that says that actually the, the best star ratings on Amazon and other places it is not a perfect 5.0. It's actually between 4.2 and 4.5. So in other words, if people can see that something's not quite perfect, and if you can lead with flaws, you know, tell people why your service isn't perfect, which is a big mindset thing for people to try and get their heads around. Should I, should I really do that? Mm-hmm. It just leads to so much trust. So for example, you know, if you're the kind of person where the client really wants an in-person interview with what, what you know, the, the service provider, but you actually don't do that, you know, even in not in Corona time, you just say, actually, I, I, I deal with people only on Zoom or Skype. That is a drawback for some people. But if you just put that out there, it at least people know, you know, look, Mm. he's talking about the limitations. That's okay. Or he only serves this area. All right. Well, you know, at least he was honest about it. He didn't waste half an hour on the phone with me. And then he finds out that he doesn't deliver to my area. Just, just put those flaws, you know, be, be clear about those things because people will appreciate it and it, it can help you build more trust with the people who actually are. Uh, interested in buying from you um, and then do the classics of content marketing you know talk about the questions that people really have so people always want to know about price people always want to know you know what's, what's actually going to go wrong if I buy this thing or if I sign up to this membership or whatever talk about those potential problems um, you know do things like industry comparisons of different services so, you know, you might be a, I don't know, you might be an expert in a field where you can talk about, um, I don't know, it might be one kind of swimming pool versus another kind. I've no idea, but I'd like to see someone who actually knows that go, oh yeah, actually you'd be better with a 
you know, this kind than that kind, and here's why, here are the pros and cons. Um, <clears throat> and on top of that, all of that, I, I always say that if you want to create whatever kind of content you create should always be in service of your content DNA, but it will, it'll be a while, it might take a while to discover what those branding blocks are for you. So in the meantime, create something that is like, that, that falls into a safety net that I've come up with, which I call CHAIR, and it's an acronym, and marketers love acronyms, don't they? <laughs> yeah, we do. So, yeah, so CHAIR stands for challenging, helpful, amusing, interesting, and relevant. If you create content that hits a couple of those high-level uh, things, so, you know, something that will divide opinion, that will help someone, that will make someone smile, and that will interest them, and above all, is relevant to your industry. You don't want to do things that are totally irrelevant. That's the kind of stuff that will get um, engagement, and, and that's the that's the that's the best thing you should be after on social media, uh, because engagement gets you eyeballs, and eyeballs get you, you know, they get you more interesting and relevant. Uh, connections a proportion of whom will ultimately do business with you and another thing you can create content around is your sales process try and put as much of that out there as possible so what is it actually like to hire me what happens like when we have our first telephone call how long is that going to be what what happens when 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 we discuss things do we move straight on to signing a non-disclosure agreement is there a a follow-up call do i have to fill in some documents what, what what's going to happen because if you if you put all of that out um it just it just again knocks down barriers and people go oh i know what to expect you know and even better if you can do it on video uh, i know that's that's a bugbear for some people because they feel you know i'm not confident i'm too fat i haven't got makeup on or whatever you know it's all too much effort i haven't got the right lighting but if you can just get yourself on camera just even a little bit it really makes a big difference because people will buy from you know the authentic person they see and if they see someone explaining how their product or service works the real person they're actually going to contact and buy from I think that's just massively powerful. So um, I've tried to, with my new website, I've tried to put myself on camera, you know, on the page as much as possible so that mm. you know you're, you're not getting an agency that's going to outsource things to another continent. You're getting me, you know, one bloke in South Wales who will write your stuff for you. Uh, that's it, for, you know, for all my flaws, that, that is what you're going <laughs> to get. So I might as well just tell you, it's me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love that. Uh, it, it sounds it sounds so simple as well, but very difficult to master. Uh, and and I think that the tips that you just said then about uh, creating content and generating ideas, uh, all that was running through my mind was the fact that everything you're saying there is to give people information and to make that journey from first of all finding you to then working with you frictionless and as yeah. easy as possible to jump from one stage to the next yes and yeah the thing that you said about stages as well that's really important because you, you need content that services every part of the life cycle of your business right mm -hmm. so uh, I, I give an example in the book about someone who's who's struggling because they can't stream their netflix in their bedroom and, and that's the problem that they'd be googling it's not netflix is not working netflix is the problem but actually the problem is that your home broadband isn't working properly and they, they, people just don't understand that it's nothing to do with netflix netflix mm. is fine your neighbors having a whale of a time um it's it's but it's your broadband that, that's that's flaky and so actually when you dig deeper and find out that it is the broadband you need something that's a bit maybe a bit more technical about showing you how you fix that mm. but your content might start with having trouble streaming your netflix uh, and it might end with here is the right router configuration that you actually need to buy. And you never would have searched for that to start with. <laughs> but the educated person who's done their due diligence might be searching for that. The person who, who is barely aware that they've got a problem is searching for something else. So you need to think, and you've got no way of predicting what state of mind your potential customer is mm. going to be in. Are they that early stage? Or is it that really late stage where they're just picking a product and they just want, they actually want to know how much it costs and where, where can I order it? Um, so you need content for all of those things. And that, that's potentially a really long cycle and um, 
you know, there's loads of content ideas in there. So I guess that comes back to understanding what the process is, what, what mindset people are in at each stage, and then thinking, right, what would help them at this stage? What would help them at that stage? And however many other stages, what can we create that will, that will do those things? And I tell you what, if you've, if you've done all of that, and then you've run out of ideas, fair enough. <laughs> but you've probably got loads of business by then because you yeah, just answered yeah. every damn question out there and the people are lining up to work with you. <laughs> yeah, you, you've already bought your velvet cape and golden crown and you, you, yeah. you're pretty happy with life by then. Yeah. yeah. Excellent, great stuff. So what I want to do now is move on to some quick fire questions because you've provided so many actionable tips. I want to put you under a bit of pressure now, if that's all right. <laughs> Fantastic, all right, let's do it cool what's that source of information you can't live without um god well google i mean i just i just use it so many times a day it's just it's just a part of the fabric of life isn't it couldn't yeah. live without it although also even though linkedin is my main place i actually get my news from twitter yeah. i can just fire up twitter and just see what's trending mm -hmm. and, and that's just a really good news source for me so i actually use twitter for news and that that's pretty much indispensable for that reason Although in the past three to four months, what seems to be happening on Twitter, especially in what's trending, if it's the name of somebody that's that's recognisable, the first the first thing that, that that probably the fifty tweets after that are like, oh, thank God they're not dead, yeah, and it's exactly. it's just like what exactly what is going the, on with the world? You know, it's, it's it's yeah, it's the Denzel Washington gif of someone just breathing out and saying, oh yes, so and so is still alive. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, I and and I, again, I suppose it links to a sad state of affairs, which we won't go into uh, about that we put celebrities on a pedestal in a yeah. way that yeah. you know we really care <laughs> about people. We don't even we've never met. Anyway, yeah. that's that's True. another story. Um, complete this sentence. The hardest thing about writing a book is. Hardest thing I've found about writing a book is getting the structure right early on. And that's the big mistake that I made with writing my book. What I actually did was gather loads and loads and loads of notes. And then I tried to retrofit it into a structure that, that you might see in a typical book, you know, chapters, a logical progression. What would have been better would have been spending some hard thinking time at the beginning and just writing the 32 chapters that I ended up writing, just listing those and then saying, right, I'm going to write these chapters. I might not write them all in order, but these are the ones I'm going to do rather than having this massive pile of notes of all different sorts of things and then trying to work out what goes together. Uh, and that, that made it, take a long time and the, the other thing if i can mention one more thing was just mm -hmm. managing the publication process because even though i've got an editorial background um just managing an editor and managing a proofreader and managing a typesetter and a book designer and an ebook creator and an audiobook producer and a publishing house to, to get the thing on amazon all of that stuff is just admin mm -hmm. and i'm not really that hot on admin or, or at least it doesn't inspire me so it was it was a real chore to get through that stage I, I wanted to just do the writing really but you know hey um so yeah that that was tough and it's it's tougher than i think a lot of people give it credit for so if you're thinking about writing a book just get ready structure your stuff and then assemble the right team who are going to help you publish it and hopefully you'll have fewer problems than I did <laughs> and and just just going back to what we were saying before about content ideas it, it I find that is really helpful to structure a, a long form piece of content is bullet point the key points and then yeah. build it from there pretty much like you said about the chapters yeah because it's all about chunking then you know mm. instead of having this blank page and going oh god I've got to write a thousand words here ah, if you if you chunk it into right I need to write a headline I need to write an opening paragraph I need to cover three points maybe and have a conclusion well, that, that already has just broken it up and it's mm. much less scary. Um, and it's just much easier to do it that way. Just, you know, you just eat it one chunk at a time rather than trying to swallow the whole thing. in one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So if you could tell your 10 year old self one thing, what would it be? Um, I would say, think carefully about what it is that you really want to do and then get ready to write a lot of stuff about it. 
because this thing called the internet is going to come along because 10 year old me would have been in 1987 um and that wasn't uh, a thing back then not really <laughs> anyway certainly not in the household um but i would have said yeah get ready to write a lot of stuff because this thing is going to come out and it will let you share your message with everyone in the world and that's going to be really really powerful so knowing what you want to do and then talking about it as much as you possibly can is the best thing to do i think you just blown a lot of people's minds there by by saying this thing wasn't around that what do you mean it was there was one point in 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 history that the internet didn't exist what did you do i know it's mental isn't it yeah it is it is crazy uh what's the most important thing to know in marketing right now um i think the the most important thing is 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 still what it's always been which is that helping beats selling I, I think it's a really really important thing to do to try and create stuff that will add value to people rather than just trying to force a sales message down their throat and i think actually now more than ever when everyone's in lockdown and everyone's feeling a bit unsure and a bit you know unsteady about themselves and not knowing what the future is going to be like now is the time to try and find ways where your business can maybe pivot a little bit and just think about what could i do to help people today rather than how am i going to sell my stuff <laughs> because when you know the green shoots of recovery come people will remember what mm-hmm. you did they'll should remember the values that you've put out into the world and that will come back to to support you in the future. Um, so, and it's, it's been the core of my business. I just take sales out of my process as much as possible and just focus on what, what can I do to help this person right now? Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, that's, that for me, that's the core of marketing is, is, is educating your customers and, and just finding ways to help them as much as possible. Brilliant. So final and most important question. If people want to find out more about you, Yep. get the book, listen to the audio book, <laughs> where should they go? Okay, well, I've got a very unusual surname, so I always tell people to look me up on LinkedIn. If you can spell my name properly, then you'll be able to find me on Google as well. So my new website has just been launched, so esperian.co.uk. You can get my book through there, and there's, it's now, um, just as of the other day, it's been rele- released as an audio book, so you can get paperback, ebook, and and audio book of Content DNA. And if you want to have a chat, and I'm always up for a chat, then look me up on LinkedIn and please send me a personalized invitation and say, you heard me on Peter's podcast, you'd like to be in touch. And that's all I need. And we can have a nice chat then. Love it. John Asperian, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I want to end on one word, which is a complete in-joke and no one will ever get it. Wibble. (laughs) <laughs> fantastic <laughs> brilliant okay i hope the blackadder fans will enjoy that one